Hey, good morning. Well, let's try that one more time. Good morning, everybody. So, welcome. I'm so glad to see you here today. It's going to be a great day. Like I said, again, as we just prayed a moment ago, it, y'all, it's just a blessing that we woke up today. It's, it's a day that the Lord gave us as a gift that we get to honor Him, to serve Him, to worship Him. And so I just want to encourage you today as you're here. Thank you for taking the time to get out. And, uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Miss Judy, and she's, uh, the choir is going to lead us to start worshiping this morning.
You can do that. Got a few right here, got a few around the room. I know there'll be some that will be in the next service as well. And y'all know uh, Gage, that's our student pastor at Lincoln that will be helping lead that team. We've got, what, over 30 that are going, right? So got a great group going to camp. Uh, I think we need to pray for them. What do y'all think? Everybody kind of look around and see where people were standing. Obviously, Gage and Lakin, especially leading that group. So if you don't mind, can we just take a few moments silently and just to pray for them, pray for our students, pray for the leaders, and pray for God to show up in power at that youth camp. Let's, let's pray for them. Lord, for our students and our leaders, Lord, we pray for safety as they travel to and from camp. Lord, we pray that they will just be open to you hearing from, for them hearing from you. And just, Lord, that we pray you speak to their hearts and change their lives. Lord, if there's any students that are going to camp, Lord, that don't know you as Savior, Lord, we want to pray for salvation. Lord, for those that are saved that are right now just maybe not been walking strong, Lord, we pray that they will learn what it means to dwell in you, uh, to hold on to you, and to be uh, in great relationship with you on a daily basis. So, Lord, again, we pray for you to move in power. And, Lord, we look forward to hearing about how you moved. It's in Christ's name we all pray. Amen. Well, a little bit later in the service, we've got our guest speaker today, Dr. Michael Smalley from the Smalley Institute. And so, again, he's been with us for the weekend. I know many of you were here already, and you know exactly what you're going to get this morning. It's going to be a great morning. And so I'll follow in our worship today. Like I said, Michael's going to come and lead us. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?
so good to us, even when we don't deserve it. Thank you for accepting this praise and this worship through song, Lord, but that worship doesn't stop right now. With the end of this song, the worship continues, Lord, with by being a living sacrifice and having open ears and open hearts to this message uh, that you will bring to us. It continues with as we go out of these doors and spread that message, spread the love, the love for you and the love for others that you call us to. Lord, thank you for this time. Continue to be glorified. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Merry Sunday. <laughs> I was like, what? That's not how you say it. Well, I am Michael Smalley, and it has been an honor to be with you guys uh, this weekend. Anyone here? At the uh, the marriage part of this thing, Friday, would you have recommended that to other couples, or would you be like, don't <laughs> stay away, not a safe environment? I think we had fun. We had we had dinner Friday night, breakfast Saturday morning. I did some stuff. I don't know how overall hopeful it was, but I hope it was. Uh, and so, you know, I've been doing marriage ministry for a long time, 26 years. I am the son of Gary Smalley, if you've ever heard of him. Anybody? Remember Dr. Gary Smalley? Yeah, that's usually, I, I, I will answer to or as Gary, because I'm usually called Gary, and many times the places I go to thought that it was going to be my dad. Uh, speaking or teaching or preaching, and it ends up, you know, me. So he did graduate to heaven, which we learned about on Friday evening, uh, March 6th, 2016. So my wife and I had the great privilege and honor to uh, care for him in home hospice. Sorry, we had this all set up, and then now I can't see. Well, why don't we just ignore technology? Uh, why can I not see the thing? Uh, so, we had the privilege of caring for him through home hospice uh, for 18 months. And, you know, this morning we're going to talk about the importance of grit in your relationship. And I know grit doesn't exactly sound like a super fun, sexy topic, but when it comes to relationships, the reality is they can be really, really hard. Uh, our main scripture this morning is going to be from Matthew. So if you have your Bibles with you or you're on a Bible app like I am, you want to go to Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Okay? So Matthew 26 and then 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Thank you. To the point of death. I mean, imagine that level of, of pain. And he's kind of separated his closest friends, right? And kind of pulled them out going, yeah, I am in desperate need of um, encouragement. And I got to get strength. And, can, you know, will you guys stand with me on this one and pray for me and pray with me? Stay, stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples, and here is where it gets interesting. Then he returned to the disciples and found them, what? 
asleep. And he said to Peter, poor Peter. I mean, if you've ever felt like a failure in your life, and you really wonder if God still loves you and if he can still use you, seriously, focus in on the life of Peter. Remember, this is the same guy that was like, Lord, what are you talking about betraying? I would never betray you. It was like the next day he betrays him three times. And yet, he still chose Peter. Maybe that says something about failure and how he uses that in our lives. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray. So, so Jesus is expressing his need once again to one of his closest friends and disciples. So that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them what? Sleeping again. And they just couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time. Oh my, this is unbelievable. Then he came to the disciples and said, you know what? Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. And we know what happens from there, if you're familiar with that. Here's, here's what grit, and this is, I think, what Christ is really showing throughout his life as we've learned in the New Testament. This was, a, a, there's a great book called Grit, The Power of Perseverance and Patience, and it's by Angela Duckworth, but grit isn't talent, grit isn't luck, grit isn't how intensely for the moment you want something. Instead, grit is about having what some reacher researchers call an ultimate concern. And there's, that's, that's kind of, it's like how did Christ how did he hang in there? Right? His, he knew what his mission was. Right? Salvation. And he knew. He's in the car going, Lord, I know what, Father, I know what you're expecting and I know what's about to happen and what's going to begin tonight. He was stressed about it. And the reason grit is so important, not just in life, but also in particular in your relationship, is that you are going to get disappointed. Anyone here ever been hurt by someone they love dearly? Just curious. Want to see hands? Every hand should go up. Unless you've had a lobotomy. If you've had a lobotomy, you've probably forgotten. But relationships aren't perfect. They go wrong. Why? Because people aren't perfect. Right? It's why I don't buy into the thing that God, you know, has. Some Christians get so goofy that God, there's that one person, right, that's just for me. And it's like, no, there's nobody that's just for you because everybody's broken. You cannot marry someone. You cannot be in a relationship with someone who is not going to sin against you. Now, hopefully, they were not doing major sin or major hurt, but things are going to go wrong. And yet, here's what Christ expects. Teacher, which, uh, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the most important commandment of the law of Moses? Jesus replied, right? So this, we should be paying attention. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God. We know this one, right? With all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But there is a second that is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I love how he ends this. The entire law. Like all of it. You can summarize and put under the umbrella of these two things. To love God and love others. It's the two greatest commands. It's the, it, it's the expectation. If you're, if you're familiar with the five love languages, right, by Dr. Gary Chapman, 
it's kind of funny because everyone always assumes my father wrote that book. And so he probably signed a thousand of those five law of language books. People would come up and they would even go, Dr. Smalley, I love your book. And they would hand him Dr. Gary Chapman's book. And he would sign it, Dr. Gary Chapman. <laughs> the two greatest things, Jesus' really only love language is obedience. His expectation, if you claim to follow him, his expectation is that you are obedient. Well, what does he expect? He wants you to love God and love others and everything else. All the commands fit under these two big ones. And this is why grit is so important. Because when it doesn't go well, right? Christ goes on uh, in Matthew to talk about that, look, in loving others, I want you to love the ones that aren't very, being very lovable. I don't really care what you do with really nice, kind, easygoing, easy to get along with people. I care about what you do to that spouse who refuses to change, for that rebellious child, uh, for the person that hurts you, right? He tells us to love our enemies. Well, who's our enemy? It's not Al-Qaeda, right, or communism. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Why would he waste breath? On love those enemies that probably none of you will ever encounter. Now the enemy is the anyone who sins against you. That's the enemy. Theoretically, she came with the enemy today, right? You're the enemy. <laughs> this is important. Grit is important. Matthew 7, 12, Jesus said, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. I love John Piper calls this Christian hedonism or Jesus-focused hedonism, right? Jesus is in essence going, look, you're selfish. You know what you want from other people. So now take what you know and do it for them. And so grit one of the best ways, I think, to live, to live grit out is through patience. You don't have to make a decision right now. Give yourself time to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. And allow time for the Holy Spirit to work on the other person. Grit, in my opinion, is never quitting. It's doing the right thing, even though someone doesn't deserve it. I mean, this is the example Christ gave us on the cross, right? And we know this. We're aware that we, we didn't deserve it. And yeah, sometimes the people you care about most in your life don't deserve your kindness. But Jesus' expectation is be kind anyways. How many out here today have a teenager? All right, that's a lot. It's all the really tired, stressed out looking people. And so my kids are now, my oldest is married. So he's 20, almost 25, and my daughter is 23, and my youngest is 19. So I still have a teenager. He's just never acted like a teenager. And I just want to give you some healthy parenting advice, especially if you have a rebellious child, right? Because grit is really going to come in handy when we're talking about parenting. Right? Because we can't quit. We have to keep it engaged in the struggle. We have to increase our patience. And so, if you're dealing with a rebellious teenager, right? My son, my oldest, in his teen years, I kid you not, could not make a healthy decision to save his life. I mean, it was literally one catastrophically stupid choice after another. He used to get so angry at me going, you're so controlling. And I'd be like, okay, dude, you're not getting it. I am borderline neglectful as a parent. I do not micromanage. That is not in my nature. I'm irresponsible. Um, I'm 
highly flexible. I'm like, dude, the only reason you have restrictions is because you keep making catastrophically poor choices, like big, big bad choices. He lost his car because we had bought his first car and I gave him three rules and he made it about 10 days after getting his license before he lost his car permanently. Like there were like three things that if you do this, it's a strike one. I'm not gonna fool around with that. And then if you wanna get a job and buy your own, you can do it 10 days after his license. He lost the car. And so we were so frustrated and as a dad, and I don't know if any of the other dads here this morning would be willing to admit this, but sometimes our children can frustrate us to the degree that we really do contemplate murder. <laughs> right? I wanna kill him! And so he had done something else and it just, I was at my wits end. And so here's, Here's my parenting advice for the day. If you have a rebellious teenager that needs to be broken, right? Humbled. Send them to communist China. <laughs> I mean, this is what they do. This is their skill set is breaking the will. And, and so I did. I sent him at 15 to China hoping that, you know, work, you know. I really did send him, but it's because one of my best friends in life was living there as a missionary with his family in Southern China. And so I finally called him and was like, dude, Cole's really struggling. Could he maybe come and spend the summer with you guys and just maybe see how the other 75% of the world lives? And who knows, maybe it would mature him. And Casey was like, dude, I'd be honored. And so I flew him and flew with him to China, which even that flight over there should have been a hint that this was going to be a unique experience because uh, we were on the airplane that set a world record of being stuck in a tarmac. Because as we were, flew from Toronto to Beijing, Somehow, Air Canada didn't get the paperwork correctly. And so, just imagine that. It was like a 13, 14 hour flight, maybe even longer, just to get to Beijing from Toronto. And then once we got to Beijing, they put us in a holding pattern for three hours. And then after that, they, they, we were running out of fuel. And so, they wouldn't let us land at the airport, so we had to land at a communist military base that was near Beijing. At which we landed, they said, you're not allowed off the plane. So they surrounded the plane with guys with machine guns. And there we sat for almost 17 hours on the tarmac. Yeah, it ended up being close to 30 hours that we were stuck. Ran out of food. Oh, I did bring some creepy cookies. Like the weirdest stuff, like cookies, like shrimp flavored cookies. I mean, it was like seaweed and goat. Cookies. It was just like, oh, this is fantastic. And so that was an adventure all in a, all in and of itself. And, and so the, the plan though is I was gonna fly there with him, leave him, he'd be discipled and live the life of a missionary in China for a couple of months, and then he was gonna have to fly back alone. So Casey was gonna fly him all the way to Beijing. Then he'd go Beijing to Vancouver, Canada, and then Vancouver to Houston. And so, uh, are there any moms that would be a little bit stressed about their kind of knuckle-headed 15-year-old son flying back alone from China? Uh-huh. So, because I am a brilliant husband, and just incredible, and basically every way. I spent my, my coping, one of my main coping mechanisms is sarcasm. That's actually my love language. Gary Chapman refuses to add that as the sixth love language, but that's mine. And so I like to mess, like I like to be messed with, I like to mess with others. And so to try to help ease my wife's anxiety 
the day leading up to the time he'd be flying. Uh, I chose to mess with him all day. Like, just, oh, this catastrophic thing could happen, and oh no, what if this happened, and hey, hey, hey. So I spent an entire day stressing her out even more, which was a really, really brilliant move. And it didn't even dawn on me what I was setting myself up for, because the, at the time he'd be starting his flight home, it would be the middle of the night for us, 13 hour time change, right? So it was like gonna be two in the morning and we kept our cell phones next to us and just in case of an emergency. And, and on the way to China, every single time we changed flights, I would look at my son and go, now remember, when you're flying home, what do you have to do every time you get up to get off a plane? Ugh, Dad, I know, okay? And I'm like, I wanna hear it. It's the one thing you can't do. That, that was my major rule. Like, there's one thing you can't do on your way back home, and that's lose your passport. So every time you get up, you got to check your passport. You say, ugh, I know, Dad, I'm not an idiot. And I'm like, ow. <laughs> your life doesn't show that. <laughs> First flight. First flight from Kunming to Beijing, he loses his passport. And so we get the call. It's two in the morning, phone rings. You know, I'm kind of half asleep. I'm like, hey, and it's Kim, Casey's wife. And she goes, hey, man, we have an emergency. And that's, you know, I immediately start going into irritated dad noise mode, right? The, oh, you got to be kidding. I'm going to kill him. Well, of course, my wife is laying there next to me in our bed. And remember, we're both marriage and family therapists. <clears throat> Just to give you perspective. And, and I'm like, no. And she's like, yeah, he lost his passport. So Casey's trying to figure out what we got to do next. And I'm like, this is not happening. My wife is next to me and her anxiety is rising, like, quickly. And she's like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, I have to ask, tell me, I can't hear anything. What's happening? Is everything okay? Is he dead? I wish. <laughs> and so finally, it kind of got on my nerves. So remember, as that perfect husband, marriage and family, PhD, <laughs> masters, I went, hey, Kim, hold on a second. And I look at my wife and I go, will you calm down? Gentlemen, since the dawn of time, has a woman ever calmed down when we told her, calm down? No. No. <laughs> that was a female verse I, voice I heard. Right, ladies? Has that ever worked? When your husband's like, chill, relax, calm down. No, they tend to get even more agitated, right? I don't know what our expectation is as a man to tell a woman, calm down. Like, like our wife is going to look at us and go, oh. I mean, what a wise, gracious, powerful man I'm in. I just realized, you're right, I'm overreacting. I'm, I'm being ridiculous. Thank you. I will obey. Or even better yet, I shall submit to your all-powerful will. <laughs> now, it never goes down quite like that. So I'm like calm, and, and then I followed it up with something borderline psychotic. I go, calm down, it's just an emergency. <laughs> Which, I said that out loud, I don't know why. Because I have mental problems. And I kind of try to get back on with Kim. Well, as you can imagine, it did not calm her down. She really spiraled right out of control. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, Kim, I gotta let you go. And so I was like, I'll call you back. I click, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Now this is also another really good move. This is basically a story to not do anything I do. 
because I followed up the calm down with you're being ridiculous. <laughs> I know. You hear it out loud and you're like, you can't honestly be in marriage ministry. But I share this because this is life. Things don't always go well. Sometimes it's the middle of the night and you're really triggered by your knuckleheaded son and you're already worried and triggered that your knuckleheaded son is traveling back from a communist country and it doesn't go correctly. Sometimes you've asked for something really important and the person just keeps falling asleep. And so at this point, we are really starting to engage in an unhealthy way. Because my wife, I'm like, my gosh, she's being ridiculous. She's like, I'm being ridiculous. You know what? And this is the best one, right? This one's a great, great line. This is all your fault. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, you don't. You were on board when we made this choice. You may not have been hoping secretly that he did get into a communist work camp, but you agreed to do this, so don't you dare lay this one on me. What I have found to be the most loving thing that we can do in our relationships when it's going south, when things are not good, someone is behaving poorly, they keep falling asleep on us, they're not meeting the needs that we've tried to even take the time and the energy to share. They keep making bad choices. Their child, they're rebelling. They're losing passports. They're getting caught with drugs. They're getting arrested. They're getting DWIs and crashes. They're, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. Right? There's a million different ways that we can mess things up because of sin. So after the finger pointing incident, I was like, that's it. So I got up, right? I'm like, oh, this fight is all like Donkey Kong. And I got around and I'm now standing at the foot of kind of the sleigh bed thinking I am just gripping the foot of our bed. And she and I both know what's about to go down because since 18 hours into our married life, we've been fighting. Our marriage hasn't been overly easy because we were just, we were just polar opposites. And so we give ourselves a tremendous amount of opportunity to melt down. And yeah, from time to time we do. So I'm just standing there. And I mean, we know it's about to hit a point of no return and we're going to start saying things that are very difficult to unsay. Right? When you get flooded, physiologically, when your heart rate gets over 90 beats a minute and you're sweating, your pits are sweating, and your feet are sweating, right? Bad things happen at that point. And we were right on the precipice. We hadn't gone over the line yet, but it was about to. And that's when my wife pulled a rabbit out of her hat and did what I have found over and over and over again to be the most powerful thing that we do in our marriage and the most powerful thing I know that people can do in any of their relationships. And with the intensity keyed up all the way, max volume, I'm standing there and I'm like, mm. My wife looks at me and says, and I quote, You need to leave this room. I swear I heard this under the bed. <laughs> because of her next statement, done in a tone that I would imagine was very similar to like Jeffrey Dahmer just before he ate somebody. Really calm and soft. And would throw you off like, I'm not going to kill you. She goes, you need to leave the room. It is no longer safe 
for you in here. <laughs> now, is that the coolest thing for her to say in that moment? No. Did she say it just perfectly? Not really. If we're already escalated, if we're already flooded, if things have already kind of spiraled out of control, you're not always going to say what needs to be said in the best possible manner. But I knew what she was asking. She was asking for a timeout. I call it now a sacred pause because a sacred pause is we need to remove ourselves from that situation and we need to run to Christ and go, what do we do now? Lord, what's your will in this situation? I need the Holy Spirit to give me some wisdom because I have no idea what just happened. And a sacred pause allows us to calm down so that we can actually come back and re-engage in a rational, loving manner that, well, that meets the two greatest commands there are, to love God and love who? Others. And I knew she wanted a time out. And so I thought, hmm, I don't like how she said it, but I can't argue this and I can't disagree. It isn't safe in here for either of us. And so I just went <coughs> and left the room, went out to the living room and spent the rest of the night on the phone with the U.S. Embassy. Oh, I still want to hurt him for that one. It's 25 and married me. But it's the next morning, because usually what will happen during these pauses, these timeouts, is the Holy Spirit is going to go to work on your soul. And I'm telling you, I guarantee he is not going to focus on the other person. He will focus on you and your part, your responsibility, the things that you need to own. And, it's, and why that's important is because when you're ready to have a loving, honoring conversation, there's no better way, like what happened even for us the next morning, I knew, it was like, I, when I finally calmed down, probably an hour later on the couch, I was like, good Lord, man, you literally spent an entire 24 hours increasing her anxiety leading up to that moment. That was dumb. And then you did nothing but invalidate her. Why would you even say calm down? It's just an emergency. That's borderline psychotic and probably do need to go get a scan of some sort. And it was like thing after thing after thing I recognized that I had done, that it had been my part. And so the next morning when I felt like it could be safe, I kind of Hey, uh, is it safe to come in? And I could hear from the other side, yes. And I open it up, I go, hey, look. And I just started to take ownership. And I put, when you do this, when you just, when you take the time to get the insight needed of what you can own in any relationship, you are now at least creating an environment and setting up the other person to be able to do the same thing. It's like hate begets hate. Yeah, that's true. But love begets love as well. That's why Jesus is like, be kind when they're not, because more than likely, it's really difficult to stay angry and obnoxious towards a kind person. It's just hard to just continue. The, the biggest way to confront that is through the opposite behavior. And sometimes we just need that pause, that time out, to gain the wisdom and the perspective needed so that we can own our part. And so as I own just being a total knucklehead, 
she started owning her part, going, hey, and look, I know this is not all your fault. That was a low blow. And yes, obviously, I, I completely own that. And I know I was on this as well. And I'm sorry for sounding so threatening, you know, for cocking the shotgun under the covers. To... <laughs> she didn't do that. Possibly. You're going to keep dealing with difficult people. <laughs> Sadly, most of the time, that will be your spouse and children. The reason grit really matters is because that, sometimes we just need to be able to hang in there long enough for the Holy Spirit to influence you and influence the other person. If you're curious on what happened to my eldest, he ended up stranded there for 13 days. Uh huh. It took six hours to get a new U.S. passport and another like 11 days just to get an exit visa from the Chinese government. <laughs> 11 days. And of course, he wasn't punished at all because they just had fun in Beijing, went to the Great Wall, and to the Swimming and I kept begging my friend, leave him at the apartment. Go do all the greatest activities you possibly can and then rub it in his face. He's like, no, that's not the right thing to do. So he eventually made it back home. And our marriage has survived today because both of us have been willing to hang in there, especially when it's tough. Let's pray. Lord, just thank you for First Baptist and thank you for Kip and just his leadership and for allowing me to be part of this family for a weekend. And Lord, I just ask in the name of Jesus that you continue to convict and you continue to poke and prod um, on everyone who's willing to listen. And Lord, just bless the, the couples, the marriages here, Lord. Bless the singles. Bless, bless every relationship and let them just be a, a lighthouse, a beacon in the darkness where people, where they are known by, by how they love each other, Lord, and how they love you. And I just ask all these things. Your name. Amen.
There's small groups available immediately after the service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for being here with us. We thank you for the message you brought through Michael. Lord, may that continue to resonate in our hearts this week as it grows into to be uh, the people that you called us to be, especially the patience and the grit to love others. Well, we love you and we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. And it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Y'all have a great day.